Hello, friends. Welcome to the 3ABN Worship Center as we continue our series on Foundation of Our Faith from the Dare to Dream Network. We have been blessed tremendously by the messages that thus far Dr. Dedrick Blue have preached from his heart, beginning our series with the coming superstorm. Then our eyes were opened when we heard him proliferate and articulate the challenge that the church is faced with, an, with a subservient movement entitled Holy Laughter. Then Draptomania, Draptomania, a title that has eluded me in enunciation, but the message was very, very clear. And the final one, They Shall Hunger No More. Stay tuned as the Lord once again empowers his servant to communicate a message born in the word, anointed by the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're tuning in for the first time, Dr. Dedrick Blue has been a pastor now in ministry for 30 years, pastor, teacher, college administrator, and surely he has a passion for many areas of ministry, including inner city ministry. He is currently the dean of the School of Religion at Oakwood University in Huntsville, Alabama. And so if there is a young man or a young person who wants to go down and learn about religion, I believe that he will be an individual that will direct your life under the anointing of God's Holy Spirit. Born and raised in Boston, Massachusetts, and spent a lot of time in New York City. Married 33 years, three grown children, and he loves the Lord and he sure does love to preach. And we're thankful for that. Also, our minister of music, Che Chin King, has warmed our hearts. Can you say amen to that? We have been blessed by the instrument that God has given to her and even the willing heart to use that instrument to the glory of the Lord. She's from Stockbridge, Georgia, a mother of two, a wife of one, and loves Jesus, loves to sing. And she's going to bless our hearts with a song entitled, My Father's Heart. After this song of ministry, the next voice that you will hear will be that of Dr. Dedrick Blue.
what an absolutely beautiful song to know that indeed, Lord, my heart does belong to you. And the only thing that I ever want to do in life is just to please my father. Amen. You know, um, if you ever stop and think about your life and think about all the times when you chose not to please God and chose to do those things which were absolutely contrary to his will, you soon discovered that the things that you thought were going to bring you joy and peace and happiness only brought you misery and sorrow. It's so much easier just to do what God asks because God is always looking out for your best interests. You know, um, I remember just growing up and walking down the street and, you know, um, having, having my friends with me. You always felt safe when you had your friends with you. You know, I mean, everybody has had their high school chums or their uh, uh, school kids who they play around. When you have your boys with you, you just feel good, you know, huh? or your girls, you know. And, you know, I have my boys with me. <laughs> you just feel good, right? Because you know that there's somebody who is always there who has your back. Well, the good news about Jesus is that Jesus is always there. He always has your back. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. He never turns his back on you. He never abandons you just because you make a mistake. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Amen. And so, Lord, because you've done all that, my heart belongs to you. Thank you so very much, Sister King. Well, we have been um, enjoying um, exploring the Word of God, talking about the last days in which we live and how the devil is preparing his troops to attack and to destroy the people of God. We talked about how the devil has infiltrated the church with dark and nefarious movements that are seeking to undermine the viability and the vitality of God's church. We also uh, uh, explored a little bit about uh, how demons enter into our life personally. But I want to let you know that I don't want to leave you in the doldrums. I do want to give you some keys and some solutions, but I also want to point you to the victory that is ours in Jesus. Because we are not here to glorify the devil. The devil does a good job at his own self-promotion. <laughs> we don't need to promote him. What we do need for, to promote is Jesus Christ as our Lord and as our Savior. So tonight, let's just bow our heads and have a word of prayer as we approach the Lord. Our Father in heaven, right now as we open your word once again, we ask and pray that you would open our hearts to be receptive to the moving of your spirit. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs> well, in Revelation chapter 7, we looked at the first verses there where uh, John saw an angel and he heard a voice saying, hurt not the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. We talked about how God has angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding back the winds until we are sealed. But I'd like to take you on the other side and show you something in Revelation chapter 7, the same chapter. For Revelation chapter 7 doesn't just talk about the coming storm, but it also talks about the impending victory. For here in Revelation chapter 7, we also see one of the grandest scenes in all of Scripture. For we are permitted to see on the other side of the conflict, and we are able to see the triumphal march of the redeemed of the ages. We see those who are sealed with the seal of the living God the mark of God's possession, the stamp of his character. They are settled into the truth of God. They have not wavered. They have not faltered. They have not given up. They have not given out. They have not given in. They have been bold and unabashed and unashamed and unafraid. And they have stood for the gospel of Jesus Christ. For they have understood it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. 
They've been through the time of trouble, such as there never was since there was a nation. And they have overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. They have overcome the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now they stand on Mount Zion with the Lamb. It is a great multitude, says John, which no man can number from every nation and kindred and tribe and people. They're all there with Jesus. I want to be there too. But I understand that Moses will be there. Moses will be there. David the king. Solomon the wise. Daniel the faithful. Hannah the mother. Samson the strong. Mary, the blessed virgin, they'll all be there. All the superstars of sacred scripture will be there. And there will also be some people there who didn't have big names. And we never knew their names. Like the little boy with five loaves and two fishes, he'll be there too. <laughs> or a woman with an issue of blood and we never knew her name and she'll be there too. Or a man who lay beside the pool of Bethesda for 38 years. We never knew his name, but he will be there too. All of them will be there, along with the superstars like Big Mouth Peter and Doubting Thomas and Little Zacchaeus and John the Beloved and Apollos the Preacher and Paul the Apostle and Dorcas the Resurrected and Isaiah, and Jeremiah, and Obadiah, and Zechariah, and Nehemiah, and all the ayahs, they'll all be there. <laughs> with palms in their hands, crying with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sits on the throne. What a grand scene. Now, you know, I know some people say, well, you know, uh, heaven will be a nice, quiet, and serene place. Right? And I'm sure it will be. I'm looking forward to being there and sitting down um, by the throne of God and putting my feet in the, in the, in the, in the crystal river, you know, and laying up underneath my, my own mango tree. You know, I'm, I'm looking forward to that, right? But I'm also looking forward to being there when the saints of God go marching in and when they sing the, the, the shouts of triumphal joy, I want to be in that number. It's going to be a grand scene, a magnanimous occasion. A homecoming celebration when the saints go marching in. I want to be in that number. But then, towards the end of the chapter in Revelation 7, there is a strange byline to this dramatic scene. A peculiar epilogue. For it says of this multitude in Revelation chapter 7, verse 16 and 17, it says this. They shall hunger no more, <laughs> neither thirst anymore, neither shall the sun light on them nor heat, for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them to fountains of living waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. They shall hunger no more. <clears throat> what a strange passage that is. They shall hunger no more. What an enigmatic phrase they shall hunger no more what does it mean they shall hunger no more well you know uh i have i have three adult children now and i have to be honest with you i am so glad that they are adults and i'll tell you why because i had the three eatingest children you ever want to see in your life both, both my sons, they're about six, three and a half, six, four. They're tall guys. And both of them weigh about 225, 230 pounds. And both of them could eat like horses. Huh? But if you think that they could eat, you should have seen my daughter. My daughter was four foot 11 and she could out eat them. <laughs> and, so, and so when I would come home at night expecting to have a lovely meal prepared for me after being out working all day in the hot sun, slaving on behalf of the Lord and his cause, and I come home to empty the pot, the pot would be empty. So when I, when I read about this text, when it says, they shall hunger no more, I thought to myself, 
does that mean, does that mean when I get to heaven, I'll never have to go to the grocery store? Does that mean I get to keep more of my money in my pocket because God's just going to feed them and I won't have to feed them no more? They will hunger no more. And I shout it. Hmm? Right? They shall hunger no more. But then I looked at this thing and I began to ask myself, what is the meaning behind this text? What does hunger mean in the Bible? Well, first of all, what does hunger mean? Every normal person knows what hunger is. It's kind of hard to describe, but it's that sensation that we associate when the stomach is empty. But the doctors will go into even greater detail than this. Hunger is a feeling that we experience when the glycogen level of the liver falls below a certain threshold. <laughs> I sound deep, don't I? <laughs> Usually followed by a desire to eat. The usually unpleasant feelings originate in the hypothalamus and is released through receptors in the liver. And although the average nourished human can survive for weeks without food intake, the sensation of hunger typically, typically begins several hours after eating. And when hunger occurs, there are contractions in your stomach. We call those hunger pains. They usually last for about 35 to 40 minutes. And if you can make it past that, then you won't be hungry anymore. That's just the sensation of hunger. But then there is real hunger. Real hunger occurs when you haven't eaten for several days or several weeks. And after several days or several weeks, then you begin to die. Right now, there are 854 million people across the world who are hungry right now. And that is up every year. Each day, there are, uh, there are 16,000 children who die of hunger in the world. One child dies every five seconds of hunger. So hunger is real. And hunger is deadly. But hunger can occur over more than just the lack of adequate nutrition. Hunger can also speak to other lacks in our lives, the holes in our existence, the gnawing pain that we have for something more. So when we speak of hunger in the metaphorical sense, we talk about want and desire and passion and lust and a drive towards satisfaction. And it's the realization that there is something that is missing in my life. You see, hunger is the gap between your need or your perceived need and the satisfaction of that need. I heard um, one saying, it went like this, I didn't originate this, but it's interesting, talking about the hunger and the paradox of our times. It says, we have Taller buildings, but shorter tempers. <laughs> we have wider freeways, but narrower viewpoints. We buy more, but we enjoy it less. We have bigger houses, but broken homes. We have more knowledge, but less judgment. We have more experts, but certainly more problems. More medicine, but less wellness. We have multiplied our possessions, but we have reduced our value. We have higher incomes, but lower morals. We have money in the wallet, but poverty of spirit. And churches are empty, and souls are empty. There's a poverty of spirit in our hearts. And too often we discover that when we get what we want, we don't actually have what we need. And there is the stark reality and the inescapable truth that we are in the midst of plenty, but we are still starving. Something is missing. Something is, is, is inadequate inside of us. There's a churning in the pit of our belly that, that longs for and yearns for something greater and something more. You know, I had a friend... His name was uh, Eddie DiVanuti. I'll never forget Eddie. Eddie looked like he was a healthy child, and 
We would go out and play, and one day we were out playing, and Eddie was running, and he just all of a sudden collapsed. He just fell down and collapsed. All right? They took Eddie to the hospital, found out Eddie had a, had a broken leg. You know why Eddie's leg broke? Because Eddie had been eating, but Eddie had only been eating Twinkies and Coke. <laughs> and so even though he looked like he was robust, his body was still literally starving. That, doesn't that sound like the condition of the world in which we are in today? People appear to be healthy and happy, but inside they're actually starving. I want to propose to you today that, that this starvation is, is, is the result of not necessarily things that we have consciously done, but it is the result of the world in which we find ourselves. And the world in which we find ourselves is a world that is encased in sin. If you live in a world that is encased in sin, there's always a gap between your perceived need and the satisfaction of that need. No matter what you do, no matter what you get, you're never quite happy. And sometimes it's not your fault. Maybe you grew up in a home where your parents were too busy and they didn't have time to show you love. So you grew up with an emptiness inside of you, a yearning for love. And the first thing that happens, some person comes along and starts whispering in your ear, baby, you so fine, you blow my mind and put their hot, cheesy breath on top of you. The next thing you know, you've run off with them because you're trying to satisfy a longing in your heart. There's a hunger that's there. Maybe you have very little capacity to love at all because you were rejected and abused as a child. And now you cannot show vulnerability. And so you end up rejecting people before they reject you. You keep the distance and you keep the wall, but inside of yourself, you long for a relationship. You want something more. There's a hunger inside of you. Maybe you're lonely and you want a friend Maybe there's a dream that you had that you stopped dreaming and stopped believing in. And maybe you undermine your own success to, because you have to bring defeat out of every victory. Maybe you find a way to talk yourself out of that degree or talk yourself out of that promotion or talk yourself out of that victory. Maybe you feel like you're stuck in neutral, like you're weighed down and that you are powerless. But when you... All added up. The end of the day, there is something that is out there that you desire to attain, but you can't reach it. You're grasping, but you can't get to it. You want it and you desire, but there's a gap between your perceived need and the satisfaction. It kind of reminds me of the old song, right? By the Rolling Stones, I can't get no satisfaction, though I try, though I try, though I try. Though I try. The gap. You know, when I was at a Christian school, and I won't mention the name of the school because I don't want to characterize the school, but it was a Christian university that I was attending. I received a phone call one night from a friend of mine. Uh, he said, Dedrick, I said, yeah, I need your help. He said, I have been studying with a young man who uh, I'm trying to bring to Christ. And he refuses to accept Jesus Christ. He says he doesn't want to study anymore. And he doesn't want to pray anymore. Because he says he has prayed for years and God refuses to answer his prayers. And so he said, because God doesn't answer his prayers, he now prays to Satan. And Satan answers his prayers. Hmm? He said, I've, he said I, I've tried everything. So he said, will you talk to him? I talked to the young man, and we had a conversation. And don't you know what happened? Shortly after I talked to the young man, I, I started receiving phone calls from the Satanists who he had been praying with. Now, they didn't know that I was praying with him because he didn't tell them. I didn't tell them. My friend didn't tell them. But don't you know that Satan has power? He does have power. These people started calling me at my house and threatening me and telling me that if I didn't leave this young man alone, that they were going to kill me and kill my wife and kill my child. Hmm? And I thought to myself, why in the world would someone go there than go to God? Because somewhere he felt 
a sense of disappointment that God hath let him down. The hunger. Pop star Katy Perry, she grew up in a Christian home. You talk to Katy Perry, she will tell you. She said, my, my parents were traveling evangelists. Hmm? And when I was a child, I wanted to grow up to be the next Amy Grant. And I prayed and prayed and prayed and asked God to make me the next Amy Grant. But when he didn't do it, she said, I sold my soul to the devil because the devil gives me what I want. Hmm? The gap, the hunger. Now, in the next few minutes, I just want to help you to understand how Satan works in this gap. I want to show you from the Bible, just for a few moments, what he did with Jesus and how it is the key to understanding how Satan seeks to exploit us in our weaknesses. In Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, you're familiar with this passage of Scripture, it says this, beginning with verse 1. It says, Then Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness, to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was a hungry. <laughs> when I read that, I said, and I hate to disagree with the Bible, but it says Jesus didn't eat for 40 days and 40 nights. Afterwards, he was a hungry. If I don't eat for 40 minutes, afterwards, I'm starving. I'm ready to hurt somebody. <laughs> right? so it said, he hadn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards, he was a hungry, right? It is at the time when Jesus is at his weakest that the devil makes his play. The tempter comes to him and says this, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to be made to bread. Now, I'm going to unfold for you the threefold strategy of the devil. It is the same strategy he uses every time, in every situation, no matter what. And when you see it, you will recognize it immediately. And once you see it, you will never be able to forget it. Look at what he does. The first thing he says is this. He comes to Jesus when he's hungry, and he says to Jesus, you're hungry, you have a need. You have a need. Listen to what the devil does. He says, Jesus, after all, you're only human. It's all right to indulge and to give in. You can't expect to be perfect all the time. <laughs> after all, Jesus, you have hormones and your hormones are talking. You have needs and your needs are pressing. It's all right, Jesus. Don't worry about what others will think. Don't concern yourself what others want you to do. Jesus, you just do you. <laughs> just a little bit of indulgence won't kill you. After all, Jesus, you need to take a break. You need a little bit of freedom. You're trying to take care of everybody else. You need to take care of yourself first. Hmm? How can you save the world, Jesus, if you can't save yourself? If you don't know how to take care of you, you're no good for it. After all, like Whitney Houston said, Jesus, the greatest love of all is inside of you. Hmm? You have a need. That's the first lie that the devil says. You have a need. Indulge it. But then he says this. The devil taketh him up into the holy city and sets him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you be the son of God, cast yourself down. For it is written that he shall give his angels charge over you concerning you in all your ways. And they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. Notice the devil says this. First, he says, you have a need. But then secondly, he says, God won't take care of your need. He said, look here, Jesus, where are you? Where are you? You're out here in the middle of nowhere. If God really cared about you, do you think he would leave you out here in this desert? And who are you doing this for? Anyway, you're doing this for God? God cares about you? Well, Jesus, if God cares about you, then go ahead and prove it. You say he cares? Prove it, Jesus. Go on and jump. 
If you jump and he delivers you, that's going to prove it. But you don't really believe it because you know that God doesn't take care of you. If you believed it, you would jump. Jump, Jesus, jump. So he says, first of all, you have a need. Secondly, God will not take care of your need. Now, I want to point this out to you. Whenever you talk to someone who has turned their back on God, it is usually because they don't believe that God will take care of their needs. Huh? They believe that God has failed them. I prayed for my mother and my mother died. I asked you to intervene on behalf of my children and they still went away. I needed some money to pay my mortgage and it didn't come. God does not take care of my needs. So first you have a need. Secondly, God won't take care of your needs. But then thirdly, listen to this. The devil takes him up into an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said unto him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. In other words, I'll supply your needs. You have a need? God won't give it to you? I will supply your need. All these things I'll give you if you will just worship me. Now, you know something? The devil always operates the same way. He convinces you that you have a need, that God doesn't take care of it, and he will supply it. And you know, the devil has uh, uh, ability to take care of some of these things. After all, he's called the prince of this world. He does have some authority in some territory. He's the prince of this world. You know, and as a prince of this world, he exercises that authority to make sure that he can appear to supply your needs. Let me give you an example. I once knew a young man who was struggling with a serious drug addiction. And every time he got clean, somebody would come to him and give him more drugs. <laughs> you know? And usually, usually, if you get drugs, you have to pay for them. But people would just come and give him drugs for free. Now, I've been to my doctor's office, and my doctor won't even give me drugs for free. <laughs> huh? The pharmacy. But these people were giving him drugs for free because the devil will tell you that you have a need, and then he says, I will supply it. I'm going to let you know today. If you find yourself continually fronted, confronted with the same sin and the same temptation and it comes too easily, then you better believe that somewhere in the back of that, the devil is behind that saying to you, I will supply your needs. I knew another man who reported a sexual addiction and he felt compelled to go out daily and find himself a new sexual partner. Sometimes he would get up in the morning and he would go out and he would always find a new sexual partner. Sometimes he would find two or three in the same day. Hmm? Now, now, listen to this. I, I know people who have been looking for, for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years for a mate. <laughs> you know, they've done everything that they thought, thought they knew how to do to get a mate. They got their hair fixed, they got the job, they have the house, they have everything, and they still can't find a mate. And yet, this man has more sexual partners than he knows what to do with. When I finally had a chance to talk with him, the man was lying on his deathbed. And all he could do on his deathbed is, 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 is have the fainting memory of fading, twisted body parts that he thought was going to bring him pleasure, but now only brought him pain and regret. Yeah, the devil says you have a need. The devil says, I will supply that need. But it always comes with a price. It doesn't come free. There are people right now who are in marital relationships and you're not happy and you find yourself in extramarital affairs because the devil says to you, listen, you're only human. Come on now. God doesn't expect you to be perfect all the time. After all, if God was going to take care of your need, he would have given you the right wife or the right husband. And because God didn't do it, 
I'm going to take care of your needs. There are people right now who are working on a job. And, and, and if you're working on a job, some of us are overworked and underpaid. Isn't that truth? Go on, tell the truth, right? Overworked, underpaid. And it's so easy to be on the job, and the devil comes to you and says, Look, man, you have a need. You need more money. Huh? God's not taking care of your needs. I'll take care of your needs. All you have to do is this or do that. But it always comes with a price. You want to know how people slide down the slippery slope to demon possession? It is at the moment of compromise. It is at the time of the gap between our perceived need and our satisfaction. That's when the devil slips in there with his pernicious lies. But I love what the Bible says in Isaiah 55, verse 2. For the Bible says this, Why will you spend money for that which is not bread and labor for that which does not satisfy? You want to know what satisfies the things of this world can never satisfy. Human beings can never satisfy you. There's only one thing that can satisfy you, and that is a relationship with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Only Jesus can fill the emptiness of our lives. Only Jesus can fill the vacuum of our heart. They shall hunger no more. You see, there's good news in the Bible for the hungry. The good news is that Jesus is the bread of life. There's good news for those who are malnourished. Jesus can supply all of your needs. From the book of Revelation, it says, they shall hunger no more. Now, I've been hungry some time, like you have, and my hunger has led me to chase Silly dreams and shooting stars, running nowhere fast, gorging myself on the empty calories of this world. And you know, I'm going to tell you something about people in the church. Because people in the church sometimes think that they are above this, but they're not. Hmm? Especially people in certain churches, certain erudite churches like our church. You know, we are erudite people. So we, so, so we do things like chase titles, chase positions, chase degrees, so that now we think that we, we, we are more because we have more. Hmm? Hmm? So, so, so I, I have some friends who went and got a degree and they got a doctor degree and, and, and now they make everybody call them doctor. I was talking to one person, and I, and I called them by their first name. They said, no, it was doctor, doctor. And I said, oh, my goodness. Someone said to me, do you have to call me doctor? I said, well, listen, when my mother named me, she named me Dedrick. It's okay to call me Dedrick. The only time somebody has to call me doctor is when I go to get a mortgage loan or I go to the bank. The banker better call me doctor then. I'm hoping I can get a better interest rate. <laughs> but other than that, you see, we get caught up in it too thinking that those things will satisfy us. Sometimes we think that our religion will satisfy us. So that if I go to church on the right day and eat the right food and sing the right song and pray the right prayer, then I too will be able to get to heaven. Hmm? Hmm? But the reality is this. There is no salvation in veggie burger and there is no grace in soy cheese. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, there is not salvation by diet, it's salvation by grace. But we reach after those things that we think will satisfy the longing of our hearts. But at the end of the day, it is empty calories. Only Jesus can satisfy there are people out there who have run from place to place. They slept in all the beds. They read all the books. They watched all the TV. They have visited all the doctors. They watched Oprah and Dr. Oz and Dr. Phil and Jerry and Maury and Steve and Judge Mathis trying to find the answers to life's perplexing dilemmas. <laughs> but in the end, 
in the end, the only thing that can satisfy is relationship with Jesus. The good news is that there is hope in the word of God. There is joy for the sealed of God. And there is a privilege for the redeemed of God. For the promise says in Revelation, they shall hunger no more. Hallelujah, right? Now, what does this mean? Have you ever been to someone's house for dinner? <laughs> and you sit down to eat. And, and, and they start bringing the food out and they put it on the table and you look. And you keep waiting for them to bring more, but that's all there is. These little teeny, tiny, microscopic dishes, <laughs> you know, with nothing in it, right? So, so, so you're afraid to eat. You're, you're, you're afraid to eat because you're afraid that the food is going to run out, right? So you get a little bit of this and just a little bit of that because you don't want the food to run out. Well, I've got news for you, good news, right? When it says they shall hunger no more, listen, the bread of heaven never runs out. <laughs> the dish is never empty. It's always full. There's always a fresh supply. You know, there's an old song that says, though millions have come, there's still room for one. There's room at the cross for you. They shall hunger no more. From the Mount of Blessings, page 21, listen to what this author says. Our Lord himself has given the command, be filled with the Spirit. <laughs> oh, I love that, huh? Because when I'm empty, God is there to fill me with his presence. You know, right now, I happen to be in Huntsville, Alabama, and my wife is in New York, and we're doing this commuting thing until we can work out the situation, the housing situation, back and forth. And so we're going back and forth. And, and sometimes I'm sitting there in that little old apartment, and I feel a little lonely. But when I get on my knees and I start to pray to the Lord, guess what happens? The Holy Spirit comes and satisfies my needs, right? We're never alone with God. He says, be filled with the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is able to supply all of your needs and to fill your life with meaning and purpose. If you come to Christ, he won't leave you hungry. He'll satisfy your needs. He'll satiate your souls. He'll fill your life. He will nourish your experience, and he's not skimpy with the portions. Hallelujah. <laughs> you, know, you know, one day, my wife and I, we went to a restaurant. Right? And, and we went in and sat down and we looked at the menu and there really wasn't much there that we could eat. So we asked, well, do you have any vegetarian dishes on your menu? And the waiter dropped his head and said, no, but let me see what I can do. And he went back in the kitchen. And then a few minutes later, out came the chef. And when the chef found out that we were vegetarian, the chef was overjoyed and delighted. He said, what would you like for me to make for you? I said, well, we don't, we don't know. He said, just let me handle it. He said, I I I'll make something special for you. And so we sat there, and a few minutes later, the waiter brought out a dish. Oh, this is great. And we ate that, and a few minutes later, he brought out another dish. And we started eating on that. And then a few minutes later, he brought out another dish, and we started eating on that. And he brought out another dish, and we started eating on that. And just when we thought that it was over, he brought out another dish, <laughs> and we started eating on that, right? And, and, and then all of a sudden, the chef uh, uh, came out, and we saw him standing in the door, peeking over at us eating with the biggest smile on his face. Then we came to understand that it was the chef's greatest joy that we would be filled, that we would hunger no more. Hmm? Here's what the Bible says. John chapter 16, verse 24. Jesus says, hitherto you have asked nothing in my name, right? He said, ask and you may receive that your joy may be full. Don't you understand that Jesus wants to fill us? Jesus has been in the kitchen cooking up blessings just for you. <laughs> He's been working it out just for you. Listen, Jesus could, 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 could hand us the standard menu and just say, select from this. But instead, he is my personal savior. <laughs> 
cooks up a blessing that is just for me. <laughs> Nobody else. <laughs> right? So he goes out of his way because he wants me to feel understood and validated and appreciated and loved. He understands that there's a gap between my desired need and my satisfaction. And so he says, I'm the one that can satisfy it. And so, Christ, he keeps bringing out new surprise after new surprise. Isn't that, isn't that good, right? New blessing after new blessing. And then after he gets finished blessing you, he brings out more grace and more mercy and more love and more hope and more joy and more peace and more faith, more and more and more and more, more deliverance, more salvation, more victory, more praise. Thank you, Jesus. Been so good to me, I can't even begin to eat it all. That's why John says in John chapter 1, verse 16, and of his fullness, we have received grace for grace. Oh, I love what the psalmist says in John, Psalms 34, verses 8 through 10. It says this. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want for any good thing. Oh, that makes me so happy, right? Huh? And so the Bible says they shall hunger no more. Listen, no more desperate housewives. <laughs> no more hungry husbands. No more abandoned children. No more rich people with poverty of spirit. No more poor people who are only rich in grace. No more lonely days or sleepless nights. No more looking for and longing for. No more weeping and no more wailing. No more running from life and running into sin. No more hiding. For then I shall know even as I also am known. For then my faith will be made sight. Then all of my questions will be answered. All of my hopes fulfilled. And all of my fears gone and all of my dreams turned into a reality. For they shall hunger no more. And on that day, I want to sit at the welcome table. I want to be there with Moses and Daniel and David and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I want to be there with Isaiah and Jeremiah and Nehemiah and Zechariah and Zephaniah and Amaziah and Obadiah and all the eyes. I want to be there at the welcome table when we shall hunger no more. I want to be there with Fanny Crosby as she sings the song, as she sings the song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. And I want to be there with Bach as Bach plays his Bach cantata, joyful, joyful, we adore thee. I want to be there. I want to be there also when the mighty clouds of joy begin to walk on the mighty clouds of joy. <laughs> I want to be there when the Dixie hummingbirds are starting to hum. I want to be there when the Messiah drummers just start to drum and the Messiah just jump up and down and praise the Lord. I want to be there to know that from this moment on, I will never again worry about anything for there shall be no gap between my perceived need and my satisfaction. But the final thing I will say to you is this. You don't have to wait to get to heaven to experience heaven now. <laughs> God at this very moment wants to supply your needs. And if you're sitting at home right now and you've got yourself in the middle of some mess, in the middle of some destructive relationship, we invite you to call our prayer line and talk to one of our counselors. They will pray with you and they will pray you through. They will point you to the word of God and help you to understand that there is victory, that there is salvation and power in the name of Jesus. If you find yourself at this moment surrounded by darkness, 
Know that God is able to defeat the forces of the enemy, and no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Know and understand that the Spirit of God is waiting and knocking at your door, urging you to respond. And so take the opportunity today to let Jesus be first in your life, to satisfy your needs, and to give you the peace and the victory that you have been longing for your entire life. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we have often chased after things that don't satisfy. Run in the wrong directions looking for blessings when all the time the blessings are there through Jesus. The devil always will say to us, you have a need. God won't take care of your need. I will supply your need. But it's a lie that always comes with a price. But salvation with Jesus is free for he has already paid the price. Now, Lord, may we walk in that salvation and victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we say amen? amen. We shall hunger no more. Are you still hungry? Are you still hungry? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Thank you, Pastor you, Dr. Blue. Thank you, sir. What encouraging words can you give to our audience as we wind down this wonderful series well, on what you have shared with us? Well, Looking forward. Well, what I would like to share with you is this, that we talked a little bit about the coming, the coming global superstorm and the emergence of satanic forces that are in this world. No one understands that those satanic forces are real. They're not metaphorical, they're not figments of our imagination, and cannot be explained simply by scientific paranormal, para, paranormal research. The devil is real, and he wants to destroy each and every one of us. But also understand that he's not just working out there in the world, he is also working in the church to undermine the church through false doctrine but also to make us complacent in the church so that we don't rise to be the holy warriors that God is calling us to be in these last days. The devil does have power, but God has all power. The devil does have a message, but we have a message as well. And it's found in Revelation. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God. Right. Give glory to him now while probation, still, uh, while probation still lingers and while the door of mercy is still open and while the angels are still holding back the winds of strife, fear him and give glory to him now for soon the hour of his judgment has come. But before that happens, it's not too late. You can still make it in. God still has a place for you. And that there is no sin that God cannot forgive. Amen. There is no chain that God cannot break. There is no pressure upon you that God cannot relieve. There is no way blocked that God cannot open. He's a mighty, a powerful, and an almighty God. And if we would but trust him, he will deliver us. Wow, I don't think he's empty by far. Can you say amen? <laughs> Wow, what do, we, what do we follow that up with? You just encouraged me to the point where I have a whole lot more sermon material. I know Pastor C.A. is taking notes. We always do that. But now, as you go back to Oakwood University, yes, sir. you have a lot of young people that you are faced with on a daily basis. Yes. What can you say to our young folk in particular today? I would say to the young people, you must come to understand that at this junction in Earth's history, you don't have time. There are really only two roads and you must make a decision. What appears to be the tinsel of this world cannot be compared to the glory that God has revealed to us. And God wants to use you now in your youth to be a holy warrior for him. If you try him and trust him now, he will take you places where you have never thought you would go and do things with you that you never dreamed were possible. 
He will exalt you if you humble yourself before him. And he will use you in mighty ways to shake the very foundations of hell to build the kingdom of God. And so with those words in mind, once again, I want to thank you for reminding us that this Thanks, is not sir. our last time, by God's grace, Thanks, that we will have you grace the stage, not only of Dear to Dream, but the ministry of 3AB. And can we all say amen to that? This food has been given to us courtesy of the Lord Jesus on high through a servant whose heart is not only willing, but you can see there's a whole lot more there. So on behalf of Dr. Dedrick Blue, Shalana King, Dr. Yvonne Lewis, and the 3ABN staff here, and Dare to Dream, we want to thank you for tuning in. Remember, there's only one foundation of our faith, and his name is Jesus. God bless you.